Hey everyone, I'm Nick Hill, composer for film, television, and gaming, and these are my five tips for getting over imposter syndrome. Most recently, you might have heard some of my work in the League of Legends franchise, the Lunar New Year track from 2023, Wheel of Time Season 2, His Dark Materials Season 3, and the official Brent Weeks companion album for the book series Lightbringer. So I wanted to take this moment to talk to you about something I'm really passionate about, something we all go through as creatives. I'm a composer, but I think this applies to all creatives and really all disciplines in general. Um, and that is the dreaded imposter syndrome. When we're first starting our careers, we're trying to find the best path forward. And we don't really know what we don't know yet. And so that leads to its own feelings of being an imposter, right? Feeling like you don't belong in the room with the rest of the professionals doing what you want to be doing. Now, a funny thing happens is success doesn't necessarily build on success. And the reason for this is our brains are not designed to make us grow. They're designed to make us comfortable. So we basically fall to the level of whatever standard we set for ourselves. We don't rise to the level of our ambition necessarily. So what happens is like you, you end up becoming successful at a couple of things. You know, you gain confidence with that. You gain experience. But if in your heart, you don't necessarily believe that you belong in the room with the rest of the professionals, your brain will find ways to self-sabotage, to bring you down to the level of the standard that you hold for yourself, that you innately believe you're actually at. And that's where self-sabotaging can come from. That's where imposter syndrome really can wreak havoc on, on people's lives. And so I think in order to develop as artists and develop as people, it's important to try to make this a primary focus in life of trying to alleviate imposter syndrome. And, you know, the purpose of this video is to also let you know that these things are elastic. They're not static in the sense that where you're at today is not where you're necessarily going to be a year from now. And you can chip away at that imposter syndrome to be the person that you want to be and to create the kind of music that you want to create and to be the creative that you want to be. So I just wanted to throw that out there, a loving message to let you know that like I've struggled with confidence issues for most of my life. And it's only recently that I've really kind of tried to make a conscious effort to chip away at that imposter syndrome. And it has had extraordinarily, uh, you know, extraordinary results in my life. I would have not had the guts to you know, try to pitch for the Wheel of Time series and then be able to be on Lauren Balfe's team to to uh, work on the score had it not been for really making the conscious effort to do that. So my life transformed as a result and I really just want to make this something that can hopefully help you as well. Now, I think it's important to caveat this. There's a difference between intellectual and experiential understanding. So what I mean by that is you hear a lot of things in, you know, various videos about career advice Maybe you're, you're a composer or you're someone in the entertainment business who is um, trying to progress their careers and you watch videos of people talking like this and you ingest that information. And while you're watching it, it's very inspiring, right? The problem is it's very hard to translate what you learned into your real life. And the reason for that is you lack the experiential understanding. So what that means is you understand it intellectually, you hear it, it goes, oh, that makes sense to me, but you don't necessarily understand it through applying, right? Through direct application. So I just want to put that as a caveat that, you know, anything I talk about in this, it's important that you kind of see, does this work for you? How, in what way could it work for you? Which is going to be different than anybody else. And if it doesn't work for you, freely discard it and find something that does. And I think that's always like the most important thing is that we're in pursuit of a way to make things work for us and our individual passion, our individual progress and our individual situation. So with that said, let's go into the five. So number one, do a little bit more each day and use the power of compounding results to help you maximize their success in any given area. So I read a few years ago a book called Atomic Habits by James Clear. I'm linking that in the description so you can kind of take a look if it interests you, but I've read it three times since. It's really kind of revolutionized my life. And, um, you know, basically the, the James Clear posits that, you know, you can make incremental changes in your life and over time those things compound. So for example, if you do 1% better today than you did yesterday, at say sending that hard email that you don't want to send, right? And you kind of get 1% better. Maybe you send one extra email this week or something like that. The next week or the next day, you can build upon that. And now you're sending maybe two more emails, right? And so it's an exponential growth rather than, um, rather than kind of a linear growth. And by the end of the year, you know, you'll underestimate how much you can achieve in a year of doing that. So I think that's, you know, that's one thing that can be really important. The way I've applied that in my own life, just so you have some further context and I can give a concrete example. Um, <clears throat> in 
is with uh, sending LinkedIn messages. So, you know, I've been doing cold reach outs and cold reach outs are always the dreaded thing that nobody wants to do. Um, so I started off trying to do one reach out in a day. After doing that for a couple of days, I felt, you know, kind of confident and I did two reach outs in a day. And then I did four reach outs and I kind of kept doubling this over time. And pretty soon I was able to do 20 reach outs in a day, no problem. I was able to do 100 reach outs in a week. And of course, you know, cold emailing is its own fine art, right? Like that could be its own separate video in the sense of, you know, there's ways to actually be genuine and, and, and kind of come from a place of giving or providing some value to the other person rather than just kind of like spamming people. So there's that one component. But then the, the other part is it takes a volume of doing them to get comfortable and figure out what works for you, what doesn't. The quicker you can get to the other side of that, the less you're going to feel like an imposter in those conversations. So that's something that's really helped me a lot and might help you as well. So the power of compounding is number one. Number two is to establish daily rituals that will remain the same and unchanged no matter how much you're succeeding and failing in your career in general. Now, for any creative person, maybe that's being creative for 20 minutes a day or something like that. For, for myself, I wanted to, to kind of talk a little bit about how I've been doing that. Um, so there's been times I've been so slammed with work. You know, when I was working on Lauren Valve's team, I was working on five TV shows at the same time, writing on every episode. And so I was like working 80, 90 hours a week. And I still made sure that every morning I would take 20 minutes for myself at the piano just to write free form. It was kind of a music journaling, music therapy for me. And by doing that, I was able to maintain a consistent work ethic and associate positive feelings towards writing original ideas that are away from picture, away from an assignment. And I think as creatives, that's a hugely important part of what we do and why we got into this profession in the first place is to be able to create our art. Of course, there is another component, a collaborative component that takes up a lot of that you know, kind of mental real estate. So, you know, reclaiming that for yourself and kind of paying yourself first creatively for 20 minutes a day can be a really good way to do that. Now that works whether you have something going on or nothing going on. That works even if you don't want to create that day. So what I've done uh, by doing this 20 minutes is on days when I don't want to create, I, and if, uh, you know, several days like that go by, I would force myself to do the 20 minutes a day. Now here's the trick. So when I would break through that and suddenly want to create for more than 20 minutes a day, I would stop myself deliberately. And I would force myself to stop so I was left wanting more for the next day. And by doing that, it just builds up this tank, this reservoir of goodwill towards creativity, right? And it becomes easier to do that particular thing because you're associating positive feelings towards it. You're left wanting more. Um, and so that daily ritual has helped me a ton. And, you know, if you have a constant in your life, when there's a lot of uncertainty, our careers have a lot of uncertainty. Let's face it, right? Sometimes you're up and you feel like you'll be up forever. Sometimes you're down and you feel the same way. And so the only constant is that change, that uncertainty. And so if we can build these constances into our daily routine, we can have something that's our North Star we can always turn to. So that is number two, daily rituals that never change. Number three is what I call identity fixation. I think part of why it becomes such a stressful situation being a composer or being in the creative profession is, you know, so much of our identity is tied to what we do. So when we succeed or we fail, our emotions go up and down wildly, right? And it starts to affect how we feel about ourselves. And that can snowball one way or the other, right? And imposter syndrome can be a huge part of that is because we have such emotional investment in what we're doing that we're constantly feeling like, are we good enough? Are we good enough? Now, don't get me wrong. There's a, there's a, something called a healthy suspicion of one's work and always wanting to make it better. But then there's also the emotional reaction. So what I've found to be an interesting way to combat that is to find hobbies and passions that are outside what you are so fixated on and try to do those alongside what you do and try to do them as much as you can in the week, you know, even if it's 10 minutes, if it's say reading, right? Read two pages a day, you know, something very small, something that's very easily attainable. But you know, as you start to do that, your mind starts to think in a different way. It's exposed to different things. Um, and so you bring that back into your creativity. 
Um, and, and you're able to approach your creativity with a kind of more of a fresh mindset. You're not constantly beholden to old habits or old habit thinking, you know, kind of thinking loops uh, in order to uh, get through the day in your career. You can kind of be open to new knowledge bases and new ways of doing things. I mean, this could be anything. This could be playing sports or this could be going hiking or this could be, you know, doing a Dungeons and Dragons group with your friends. Whatever it is, you know, it forces you to think in a different way. And so when you go back to your creative pursuit, you're constantly approaching it in a new and fresh way. So, you know, I just wanted to let you know that sometimes the things that almost feel like they're taking you away from your career can, const you know, can give you these tools in your toolbox to be able to approach your career in a way that kind of like makes you constantly look at it with fresh eyes. Fourth way I would say is that we want to separate feeling from fact. So you know how I mentioned in, in kind of number three that um, a lot of what we feel about imposter syndrome is such an emotional response, right? So I think it's important to se separate facts from that emotion and kind of the way to do that. So this is really an extension of three, but going into four kind of a way to do that is to be able to state clearly what the facts of a situation are. So if you feel like, oh, I don't know if I should be pitching for this particular thing. You know, these other composers are so much better than I am. I don't know if I would be able to get it right. You could speak in facts about your own career, what you have accomplished at that point. It doesn't matter what it is, but being able to speak to it in, in, in a factual way takes the emotion out of it and lets you be able to focus on the problem at hand in a more clear vantage point. So, you know, number four is really trying to separate the fact from the emotion. Now, where the emotion can be really important and helpful is by practicing what I do every morning, which is a three and three, which is three different things that I can feel grateful for at the start of the day. And they could be big or small. It could be what I ate for breakfast. It could be getting to work on the wheel of time, right? Like it could be anything in between. Um, and then and after sitting and closing my eyes and sitting in silence and observing those three things and visualizing what it felt like to achieve those three things and be in that space, you know, using that emotion to kind of turbocharge your day and then go into these are the three outcomes that I want to um, achieve either today or in the week or in the year. And again, making them something that is very fact based. So, for example, if you want to compose for a TV show, what kind of TV show? Is it a fantasy show? Is it a sci-fi show? Is there a particular director that you'd want to work with? So that's a little bit more fact-based, right? But you can use your emotion to kind of think about that and go, how would that feel? You know, sitting in the room with that director, going to a spotting session, you know, watching it for the first time, knowing... I am going to be working on this and using that to tur turbocharge your day, using your emotions to visualize where you want to be rather than visualizing, should I be there? Does that make sense? So that's number four. And the final tip is um, to develop a healthy relationship with uncertainty by making failure fun. What I mean by that is, you know, when I started first, I, kind of going back to the first point where I was talking about writing emails to people. At that time, it was very scary for me to do it. I would literally be shaking writing this email. I would be looking at it like six times before pressing send. I would change the word the to a and a did the, like it was like that kind of a thing. Right. So um, so what I started doing is I would put on a timer and I would go, OK, I'm going to give myself an hour. I'm going to write as many emails as possible and try to get responses from them. It doesn't matter if it's a success or a failure. You know, just try to change my wording, figure out ways to elicit a response, right? And as the failures would come in, as the rejections would come in, we already have a composer, you know, please stop emailing me, you know, <laughs> whatever it is. The first few are scary, but as you start to rack them up, you go, oh, that wasn't so hard. You know, it's no big deal. Like, and as you start to do that day in and day out, you get used to the concept of uh, failure and you realize that you're still doing it every day. It's still your ritual of, you know, sending those emails, those hard to send emails or, you know, put, making a social uh, like a piece of social content that you're scared to put up online or whatever it is. And it's like as you start to do that, it starts to normalize that behavior and it doesn't seem like such a big deal. So you rack up the failures, you rack up putting yourself out there and taking that risk and it starts to normalize that. And then when you start succeeding, it feels great. But 
it doesn't feel like you're fully beholden to that success that, you know, your emotions are completely dependent on it because it's just something you do day in, day out. That's just a part of who you are. So if you're going to identify with anything, you want to identify with those habits that are going to help you actually get there. So I hope that kind of makes sense. And I just want to add one last thing to kind of lovingly remind you all, everyone is going to succeed and everyone is going to fail at something. This is just natural. And everyone is going to have imposter syndrome at, at some stage in their lives. And as we succeed, the scale of which our uncertainty and our risk tolerance changes, right? Um, so it's always going to be something we work on. It's a work in progress. It's not about going like, oh, now I'm fine. I'm fully confident in who I am. I'm a complete person. You know, I have nothing left to do because then you don't grow. So it's constantly a thing of growth. And so I think it's important to remember these are just things we do during the day to get that one step closer, that one step closer with knowing that no matter if we reach where we want to go or not, as long as we're taking that next step each day, then we're kind of getting closer to the person we want to be when we get there. So with that, I'm Nick Hill, composer for film, television, and gaming. Let me know in the comments if you know this resonated with you at all. If you think I'm full of crap, let me know in the comments as well. I, I really want to just make this a dialogue and kind of let me know what you agree with, what you disagree with. If you have any other points to add, you know, I also want to, you know, in addition to releasing music here, I want to create a positive community where people as creatives can support each other, and provide different ideas to help each other grow. So please like and subscribe if you haven't already and you're enjoying this content. And um, I'll keep posting these periodically. But I'm Nick Hill again, composer for film, television, and gaming. Be good to yourselves, be good to each other, and I'll see you soon. Take care.